Something quite interesting happened, namely a white paper was published just a short while ago by SpaceX in cooperation with the NASA Ames Research Center and lots of other members from JPL and other institutions and universities. This white paper is particularly interesting because we finally get some details on how SpaceX will want to build the first Moon and Mars spaces. Link of course in the description. And you will certainly not believe it, but we can find many of our weird theories in there. For example, to use starships as the first habitat modules, or how many astronauts the first crewed flights to Mars will contain. There is also talk on how payloads will be transported to the Moon and Mars, and of course, what kinds of payloads. So let us then analyze this fascinating piece of information so that we can hopefully understand a bit better how SpaceX will build us these lunar and Martian colonies that had been promised to us since the 60s, and also what NASA's role will be in all of this. The lead author of the white paper is Jennifer L. Heldman from the NASA Ames Research Center, pictured here. The white paper is titled Accelerating Martian and Lunar Science Through SpaceX Starship Missions. After a brief introduction, the paper starts by pointing out Starship's superior capabilities. Quote, An appreciation of Starship's capabilities is important for understanding how and why this vehicle can provide unprecedented opportunities for the planetary science community to fly payloads to the Moon and Mars, thus advancing NASA planetary science and exploration. End quote. Man, if just everyone at NASA would understand this. But I always knew that NASA has lots of intelligent people that fully understand the groundbreaking potential of Starship and Super Heavy. Then the technical specifications of Starship are detailed, which we all know by heart now, 100 plus metric tons of LEO payload capability, the same amount to the Moon and Mars with orbital refueling, and so on and so forth. On page 3, it is being detailed that a Starship has a very large interior volume of 1100 cubic meters most of which is pressurized for human habitation. Then an 800 cubic meter liquid oxygen tank and a 600 cubic meter liquid methane tank. We also knew that. But now here is an interesting thing. Quote, both tanks have a stainless steel primary structure and may be repurposed later as pressurized living space on the surface of the Moon or Mars. End quote. Hmm, this is interesting. It would be so perfect to use that gigantic space and to convert the starships themselves into huge habitat shelters. Imagine 1100 plus 800 plus 600 cubic meters of habitat space per starship, so 2500 cubic meters of living space per single starship. That is 2.73 times the interior volume of the entire International Space Station. It's crazy. Afterwards we can read, quote, these first crewed starships will likely each have about 10 to 20 total people on board with an additional 100 plus metric tons of available cargo mass per starship." End quote. This is also something we've mentioned in a few of our older videos. In a NASA study from 2011, link in the description, the minimum habitation volume per crew per person for different voyage lengths was estimated based on different psychological factors. We can see that the function follows a logarithmic curve. So for a 180 day voyage to Mars, we would get a minimum space requirement of 22 cubic meters per person. So that is the minimum. To be on the safe side, a higher volume would be advisable. We were always very skeptical of the number of 100 astronauts per flight to Mars, as this would only give each crew member about 11 cubic meters of space for this very long voyage which is only half of the suggested 22 cubic meters per person for a flight to Mars. Therefore, the number of astronauts that Jennifer Heldman writes in the white paper of 10 to 20 makes a lot more sense. We can then read, quote, Cargo carried on these flights will include additional equipment required for human health and productivity during transit to the Moon or Mars and on the surface, end quote. And then she details the cargo, quote, Current SpaceX mission planning includes the intention that these vehicles will also carry hardware needed to support the human base, including equipment for increased power production, water extraction, LOX methane production, pre-prepared landing pads, radiation shielding, dust control equipment, exterior shelters for humans and equipment, etc. 
We suggest that the manifest could also include science payloads designed and built using NASA funding." End quote. Sounds very logical. So NASA could contribute science payloads, but especially also habitat modules or power generators. On Mars, we won't be able to only rely on solar power, as Mars is known to have some pretty nasty dust storms that can cover the entire planet for months, drastically reducing sunlight that reaches the surface and also covering the solar arrays with a layer of sand or dust. Solar panels will be of no use during that time, so we will 100% certainly need additional power sources such as thermoelectric power generators. These power modules employ the heat that is being created by radioactive decay and create electricity with the thermoelectric effect. NASA already has such kilopower modules in the works, one of which can supply around 10 kilowatts of power. Now that doesn't sound much at first, but they are quite transportable with only around 1.5 metric tons of mass per module. So 10 such kilopower modules could fit into one Starship cargo bay without any problems, as they would only take up 15 metric tons of the available 100 metric tons of maximum cargo capacity. The maximum solar intensity on the surface of Mars is a bit more than half that of Earth, around 590 watts per square meter. So one kilopower would deliver the equivalent of 17 square meters of solar arrays during peak power, which is really not bad for such a small device. And that device gives continuous power for very long periods of time, independently from external weather events. The authors then also mention landing pads, which is very interesting, water extraction, very important also, and of course LOX and methane production because we must create propellant for future return trips via the Sabatier reaction directly from the CO2 atmosphere of Mars. Then exterior shelters are mentioned, hopefully of the expandable type because they just make the most sense as they can be transported easily in deflated mode and yield a lot of habitation volume for a comparatively small weight. And then radiation shielding is also mentioned and this is in fact ultra important. I cannot stress how important radiation shielding is. The average radiation dosage equivalent on the surface of Mars is around 240 millisieverts per year. A total safety lifetime dosage would not exceed one sievert. That would correspond to being outside on the surface of Mars continuously for four years straight, which of course will never happen. Yet still, radiation of course also penetrates into the interior of Starship. And here the white paper continues to be very interesting. Quote, humans will likely live on the Starship for the first few years until additional habitats are constructed. So the radiation risk must be assessed and mitigated with equipment planned to support this initial infrastructure. The first wave of uncrewed Starship vehicles can also be relocated and or repurposed as needed to support the humans on the surface. These vehicles will be valuable assets for storage, habitation and as a source of refined metal structures and resources. They also could accommodate scientific research laboratories." End quote. Now, this is quite some good stuff here. So for the first few years the Starships themselves will act as habitation bases, something which is absolutely logical and makes sense and we've been actually proposing this in our older videos since over two years now. Also interesting is that the starships can be repurposed as needed. It is not a good idea to just live in the starships while they are in an upright position. The problem is that highly energetic cosmic particles will bombard the starships steel hull and create very highly energetic secondary neutrons that are really very damaging to biological tissue and would severely damage the astronaut's DNA. In order to reduce that, I would highly advise bringing a crane along to Mars on the first flight and bring the previously landed cargo starships that will be already waiting for the first astronauts into a horizontal position. Then afterwards cover the starship with Martian dust and sand, which would act as a radiation shielding. The residual radiation under a multi-meter thick layer of sand would be quite negligible so I personally think that this is an absolute must. Then the starships will act as habitation space giving 2500 cubic meters of living volume per starship together with the tanks. This can of course be also done on the moon. We have talked about it in some of the last videos where a group of students have actually proposed exactly this 
on the International Astronautical Congress in Dubai only a month ago. So I have to say I'm extremely happy to see these concepts being brought forth. There is not a better way to build a safe and secure moon and Mars space than using Starship itself as a starting point. Later of course the bases will get more elaborate and then we can start building all kinds of cupola structures, greenhouses, rotating habitat modules for artificial 1G gravity and much more. Later in the paper it's also emphasized how important Starship will be for scientific missions and that it will allow unprecedented scientific exploration missions to be carried out that would not have been possible without Starship, such as for example extremely large space telescopes. Later we can read, quote, A unique aspect of Starship is its capacity for large-scale transport of people to planetary surfaces. This could drive accelerated development of a sustained presence on a lunar surface. The same approach could apply to Mars. The planetary science community must be prepared to take advantage of these flight mission opportunities, including on the many uncrewed landings anticipated as part of the SpaceX plan." End quote. Well, what can I say? This is a delight to read. Indeed, accelerated development of a sustained presence on the lunar surface something which we would not have seen in our lifetimes had Starship not been developed. Boeing or Lockheed would certainly have not built us that sustained presence on the Moon or Mars, that is clear. And then lastly, it's emphasized how important it will be that NASA already now works on a strategy on how to make full use of Starship. Quote, the ability to deliver large payloads and significant numbers of crew to the surfaces of the Moon and Mars highlights the need for an integrated strategy among NASA's Science Mission Directorate SMD, Human Exploration and Operation Missions Directorate HEOMD, and Space Technology Mission Directorate STMD. End quote. So basically the different directorates within NASA should already get together and work out a long-term strategy and already define some milestones. Excellent idea. Then there is a talk about timelines, namely that SpaceX wants to send cargo starships to Mars either in the 2022 or 2024 launch windows and that the first starship landings might be tested out on the moon. The authors strongly suggest of making use of these test flights to already bring some scientific payloads to the moon. Quote, in order to take advantage of these opportunities, a new funding program within NASA is needed to provide the opportunity for members of the community within and outside of NASA to fly robotic payloads on these flights." End quote. Also an excellent idea. Now let's hope that the higher ups at NASA will take this seriously, because unfortunately the power is not in the hands of engineers and scientists at NASA, but unfortunately quite often of the decision makers high up that are totally entrenched in politics and have to be careful not to offend certain political interest groups. These interest groups have a very strong desire to keep the SLS alive as long as possible because you know jobs, lobbyists, corrupt politicians and so on, the usual stuff. So let's hope that people within NASA will take notice of this white paper and start making the preparations. The only thing I was missing is to have Starship rotate in some form on the journeys to and from Mars. It would be highly beneficial to have some form of artificial gravity for the trips. But hey, that's just my opinion. I just think it would be far better if astronauts arrived with healthy muscles and bones on Mars and could walk from day one. Also, radiation shielding on the trips to and from Mars would also be something worthy of consideration in future papers. Apart from that, I'm extremely happy to see so many excellent ideas being picked up and explained in this amazing white paper. So then friends, this is some good stuff happening here. I wish you a nice day, all the best from Jishuan and me, and on to the future!